G'day everyone, this is Health Highlights. Health Highlights is a show about health, health professionals, and the people and the stories behind the names we hear about we seldom get to meet. Now if you're a parent, you're gonna understand this. There are days when your kids are just doing whatever they do, and you just wish you had a magic wand to wave it around and they become an angel. <laughs> well, I don't know if any of you ever watched that show Super Nanny with Joe Frost, but she seemed to have that ability just to wave something and all of a sudden the kids would be better. So today, we wanted to introduce you to Newcastle Super Nanny, Prue Prue Hughes. How are you, Prue? I'm very well, thank you, Simon. Thank you. I'm not a real Super Nanny. Oh, I know, I know. But I just like calling you that because everyone understands that concept. They do, so they do. can you actually tell us what is your qualifications and what do you actually do? Sure. So I have a degree in education, but not like a teacher. So my degree is in disability education, which is more about skills development and coaching rather than classroom style teaching. Awesome, awesome. And so it's not a, a profession most a lot of people get into. So how did you get into doing what you do? Um, I guess when I was at uni, I started working part time yep. as I was going through uni and I found that I really enjoyed working with people with complex behaviour. So that really set the scene for the rest of my career and I found that being able to help people with difficult behaviour to be understood and to learn new skills so that they didn't have to engage in difficult behaviour um, was just something that I really enjoyed doing. Awesome. And is there... Is there a connection with your past that, that allows you to have a passion for this or is it just something that you're passionate about helping people? Um, no, look, pro I mean, I'm the eldest of four. Uh, obviously, the eldest is the perfect child, so I never had any challenging behaviours myself, right, obviously. Right, of course, absolutely. Um, <laughs> my parents would say otherwise. Yes. Um, but I guess um, I've always enjoyed being around children and young people. Yep. Um, but that said, I've also spent a lot of time working with adults as well. Okay, wonderful. And so the question is, okay, you've got psychologists, you've got paediatric OTs, we've got paediatric speech, you've got paediatric... How, where do you fit into the scope of care for someone who maybe has complex behaviour problems? So I guess I work very, very closely with all of those different professions. Right. So psychologists, clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, paediatricians, um, speeches, they are all professionals with whom I spend a lot of time working and collaborating. One of the key differences between the work that I do and the work that those guys do is that I don't diagnose. So a psychologist, um, a speech therapist, occupational therapist, they're all skilled in diagnostic um, work. So they will make diagnoses around speech and language delay, um, sensory processing issues, um, autism, cognitive functioning. What I tend to do is work with people after they've had a diagnosis. And sometimes what I'm doing is taking advice and recommendations from those professionals and turning them into practical strategies for parents and families oh. to use to address behaviours of concern. Which is what parents want, isn't it, really, in the end? You can get a diagnosis, but to have that practical application to be able to outwork it every day is super important. That's right. So I know one of the things that you do, which is quite unique, is you actually go out to someone's home and you actually sit in their environment and help them implement some of these strategies and plans. How beneficial is that in terms of your role and helping people actually get the solution that they're looking for? Yeah, sure. I think um, home visits are very, very valuable. Um, so are school visits and clinic visits. Oh, of course, yeah. Um, and I think um, being able to work with a family in their own home provides me with an opportunity to gain more thorough understanding of the situation that is individual to them. So somebody can come and visit me in a clinic and they can talk to me about what home is like and what the issues are. When I step into their environment, mm. I get a lot more information just by walking into somebody's front door. Um, and so I guess it provides me with an opportunity to um, make recommendations that are better suited to them yep. contextually. Yep. Um, and of course, it also enables people who can't get to a clinic to be able to receive a service. Wonderful, yeah, of course, because there's some people that just can't even get That's in. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, you get into someone's home um, and you see parents, mainly you're supporting parents, I'd imagine. It's a lot of about helping the parent know what's going on. Um, what are some of the biggest mistakes that you actually um, are seeing that parents are making um, and some of the ways that we can actually maybe um, help ourselves help our kids? Yep. So, I'll go back a little step. So yeah, I do spend most of my time supporting parents and carers. So again, 
that's another point of difference between myself and say an occupational therapist or a speech therapist. Those guys will spend time working with the child in a therapeutic setting. I spend time working with the parents or the carers actually providing them with direction and guidance. Yeah. One of the, well there's a lot of things I see um, that um, I guess are not mistakes, they're, they're just things that we can improve on and we can all improve on the way that we raise our children. Um, I think the way we live today in the society that we live in today, there has become a big blur in the distinction between the role of a parent and the role of a friend. So oh, wow. I very often see parents saying things to me like, oh, I don't want to say no because I'm worried that he's not going to like it if I say no. Or, oh, I don't want her to not like me. I'm worried what my child will think about me. Helping parents to understand the role of a parent um, as opposed to the role of a friend is actually very important in terms of the way we provide parenting to our children. So is that really around the whole fact that parents are needing to provide boundaries for the kids rather than just being a part of the journey with them? Absolutely, and I think um, parents, I think it's easy for us to say, oh, kids need boundaries, mm. kids need boundaries, and we can bandy that term around a lot. What boundaries look like though, um, are different um, in each individual situation. However, all children need boundaries, routines, consistency, stability, predictability in order to feel safe and secure. And I think helping parents to understand that implementing boundaries, which is different to just talking about them, but implementing boundaries is a very key role um, in the job of a parent. And helping parents to actually be confident in that. So there's a, a, there's a lot of parents who are not confident to parent because they're worried about doing the, the wrong thing. Mm. Oh, because there's so much out there. And what do you do, do this, do you do that? So then the next question is bad behavior. Like what, why do kids have bad behavior? Are there some key things that you can share with us that maybe help us to understand that? Yeah, sure. Um, all behavior serves a purpose. So mm. as humans, we don't engage in behavior for no reason at all. Even if it's subconscious, there's actually a reason for our behavior. And I guess what we need to be clear about, I, I suppose, is thinking about the concept of bad behavior. So what is bad behavior? And um, what you call bad, I might not call bad. So I spend a lot of time with families saying, why is this behavior a concern for you? Is this a behavior that's just an inconvenience? Or is this a behavior that has a significant impact on a child's ability to function in normal everyday life? It's that second category that we really need to pay a lot of attention to. And I guess working with parents to understand that there is always a reason for their child's behavior. Yep. And that reason will be um, made clear the more time I spend with the family. So sometimes I actually have to do a behavior assessment yep. to work out why the behavior is occurring. Sometimes it's apparent fairly quickly, um, but it's more about helping the parents to understand this, this is the behavior, this is why it's occurring, and that's different for, for every single situation. There's no single statement that I can make today that says bad behavior be occurs because of this. Um, it's different in all sorts of situations, but there's always a reason. Wonderful, that's, a, that's wonderful advice. Um, so when it comes to the home, or it comes to the school for teachers, for example, mm -hmm. um, what are some of the principles that you would use to actually help kids who maybe have a diagnosis or have a condition, what are some of the key things that we can do to support them in their environment? Consistency is a huge thing. Mm. And again, it's a word that we throw around a lot and we say it's a bit like concept of boundaries. We talk about it a lot. Taking it from a discussion to um, real life implementation is something very different. So being able to um, help people understand what consistency means mm. in real time and helping parents, carers, educators take the every day, their every day, and actually say, this is what consistency means for this child. And we can't be a little bit consistent. We have to be consistently consistent. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> um, so making sure that, I mean, a principle is, is consistency. So we have to, that's a very, very key mm. principle. Um, communication is another thing that we really need to make sure that we have addressed. That's not just communication between the child and their parent or teacher but communication between the whole team of people. Yep. You talked about kids who might already have a diagnosis. In those situations, there is often 
a team of people already working around that child, it's important that all of those players are communicating with each other. Um, Because I could be recommending one set of strategies, but I could be making recommendations that are completely opposite what somebody else is saying. So it's very important that everybody is on the same page. Um, And I think then also boundaries, knowing what the boundaries are for that child. And they will look different Mm. from situation to situation um, depending on the needs of the child. Wonderful. So tantrums and uncontrollable children. I think that's probably one of the parents' biggest fears when you're out in the public. Um, What is your advice around tantrums and and, and controlling kids that are uncontrollable? Do you just let them go? Do you, what, what, what would you suggest? Tantrums, and often when we talk about the word tantrum, we're, we're picturing toddlers mm. and a very you know, typical throw themselves on the floor in the middle of woolies and demand that you know, they get that kinder surprise right now, right then. Um, that's a very typical part of childhood development. And I think it's really important that parents don't fear that. Right. There is a lot of fear around, oh no, what are people going to think if my child is that child? Have I just become that mum in Woolworths who's yes. got the, the toddler on the floor or the five-year-old even on the floor having a great big uh, tantrum? That's, that's not something that needs to necessarily be seen as a judgment on the parent. And there's a lot of concern out there, especially with um, social media. And everybody's got an opinion and everybody's able to say this and, you know, oh, that mother did a bad job or somebody's concerned that they're going to be videoed in the middle of the shopping centre. I think it's helping parents to understand that they need to respond to that tantrum in the shopping centre just the way they would respond to that tantrum at home. Um, And recognising, I think, that it's a normal part of childhood development for kids to lose control of their behaviour. Recognise also that... Children are children, they're not adults in tiny bodies. Mm. Um, I think there is this shift that needs to happen in terms of expectations on children. Mm. So when parents come to me and say, my child is four or three and they're having great big tantrums, and I say, so what is your expectation around typical behavior for a three or four year old? Wow, that's great. They don't want to, they don't want to put tantrums in there. And I say, but that's developmentally appropriate. Mm. When you look at developmental psychology, that's actually quite normal. And so it's about giving parents some in- ev- oh, sorry, some information and education around what to expect mm. with a child of that age and at that stage of development. So then when does it become, when can they start controlling their emotions more? Like when we should we expect that, you know what, my child shouldn't be falling to pieces? Yeah, look, I, by the time they start kindergarten, they should be being able to maintain some degree of control Mm -hmm. over their behaviour. I guess I get a lot of parents that say the child is fabulous at school, in kindergarten, and comes home and has a great big tantrum. That's also not uncommon Mm behaviour. Kids work very hard to hold it together when they get to school and they come home and they have to let off steam. Um, I think it's important that parents take on board information that comes back to them from schools. Teachers are fantastic at knowing what is age appropriate for children at school. And so if a teacher raises a concern with a parent, then that's probably the time at which a parent should start to think maybe they do need to seek some additional support. If a teacher's not raising concerns with them about school-based behaviour, then that's a good thing too. Yeah, that's wonderful. That's great advice and so helpful, I am sure, for a lot of you parents out there, including myself. I've got four (laughs) kids. They can be at times very trying. Final question. What would be your top four tips for great parenting um, in 2018, considering we've got devices and all those things. I'm gonna say number one is be present. Mm -hmm. Um, Kids can't raise themselves. Yep. And we live in a world that is incredibly and increasingly busy. Um, But we need to be aware of what our priorities are and children need time. They don't magically grow themselves up overnight. Parenting is a very time intensive but incredibly valuable and incredibly rewarding job. And parents need to be present, um, physically present and emotionally present. Um, it's sort of heartbreaking to go to a park and see kids you know, playing and parents on devices. Yes. Um, and what I get often is parents saying to me that their school age child is spending way too much time on a device or their high school age child is on the phone all the time or on their device all the time. When you then go into the home and do some observations, you perhaps maybe see behaviour that's being picked up from mum and dad 
um, who might also be attached to a device more than they should be. Um, so being emotionally present is incredibly important. Um, there's a saying that talks about the fact that um, what, what to us seems like little things when our children are coming up and sharing things with us, to our kids, they're big things. Mm. And if a child wants to come up and tell you something about their day and we're distracted, whether it be on a device or whether it's that we're trying to do a thousand things at once, um, if we're not emotionally present for those kids, they will stop coming to us. Mm. They will stop coming to us. So being present is probably the first the first wow. thing that yeah. the parents need to think about. And I recognise I'm not, I'm not silly. The, the demands on parents these days are intense. Um, there are many many more single parent families out there there's many situations where two parents have to work financially have to work um and it's a juggle it, it's a real juggle but i guess my part of my role is to help parents to look at what could be contributing to the behavior challenges that they're facing in their family yep. and i guess then the second thing i would say is be if one is be present two is be prepared to make changes mm. um if we want to see different results, we have to do something different. Yep. We can't expect to achieve behavior change if we're gonna to continue to do the same old thing time and mm. time again. So I have to ask parents often when I start working with them and say, so what changes are you prepared to make? Um, what are the things that are off limits that you can't change? And what are the things that you can change? Awesome. And most of the time, there's more things that we can change than we originally realized. And that can be simple things like having a structured day of the week where it's a family meal time, um, having cutting down on extracurricular activities um, if that's possible, um, and increasing the amount of time that a family gets to spend together. So being prepared to make change is is another thing. So good. Um, being consistent. We talked about consistency yep. before, but being consistent is really really important in the way that we parent our, our kids, and it's one of my I would say top tips. Yep. Um, and I think what we have to recognise is that if we're not consistent in the way that we interact with our children, in the way that we respond to our children and support our children, on the surface it looks like we're probably creating more behaviour problems. But let's take it deeper than that and think about the fact that the message that sends to that child for the rest of their life is that mum or dad never ever follow through with anything they say. Mm. So what we end up doing is building a platform in the relationship between the parent and the child that says, mum and dad are unreliable. Mm. And I don't know about you, Simon, but that's not a message that I want my kids totally to right. have about me. Yep. I want my kids to think that I am reliable yep. and I am trustworthy. Mm. And that will only come when we are consistent in the way that we parent our kids. Totally. That's great. So, we have to think about, we've all done it. I, hey, I can put my hand up. We've all done it. We've all blurted out things in the heat of the moment when it comes to managing behavior. And we've all said things like, that's it. I'm taking all your toys away. I'm throwing them in the bin. Um, but in fact, we don't do that. And those little things, if we don't think about the things we say before we say them, those things that we can't actually implement, yes. they become this very shaky platform. Mm. And we need to try to avoid setting ourselves and our kids up to fail in that Great. way. That is so good. Wow. Yep. Well, that's some amazing advice, Prue. And I'm sure you out there have really enjoyed hearing um, some amazing insights into behaviour and behaviour management and how we as parents and carers um, and teachers can potentially um, help some of the young people that we're trying to grow up into adults. So Absolutely. congratulations on all you're doing. You do an amazing job helping so many people. Um, and thank you everyone for joining us. If you want to find any more information about Prue or you have a question, I'm sure she's more than happy to maybe answer a few questions. You can yes. just leave a comment. Um, her details will be on the screen for you right now. Look, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And taking the time. Have a great week. Remember, we'll see you the same time, 12.30 next week. Remember, healing is a gift, health a responsibility. See you later. See you.